please take your Bible this morning, go to James chapter 4 with me, please. James chapter 4 for our scripture reading this morning. <clears throat> we are going to read verses 6 through 10 of James chapter 4. James 4 and verses 6 through 10. We're reading the verses responsibly as we normally do, begin together on verse 6. I'll read 7, reading 8 together, alternating until we end together on verse 10. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. <clears throat> All of us standing, please, to read God's word. And let's begin together now in verse 6 of James chapter 4. Ready? But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Let's pray. Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of the scripture here this morning. Thank you so much, Lord, for the word of God. Thank you that we have copies of it in our hand this morning. Lord, I pray that each of us would be prepared to receive your word. That, Lord, we are thankful for the music we've heard this morning. We've been able to sing and listen to and it's blessed our soul, and we pray, Lord, that it's been uh, a blessing to you as well as we've sung our praises to thee. Pray your blessing on the special now. Use it again to help our hearts to be in tune with your heart. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Pilgrim was I and a wandering in the cold night of sin I did roam when Jesus the kind shepherd found me and now I am on my way home he restoreth my soul when I'm weary he giveth me strength Day by day, he leads me beside the still waters. He guards me each step of the way. When I walk through the dark, lonesome valley, my Savior will walk with me there. And safely his great hand will lead me to the mansions he's gone to prepare. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And I shall feast at the table spread for me. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. All the days, all the days of my life. <laughs> Amen. It's good. Father in heaven, we bow before you now in prayers. We come to the preaching of your word this morning. We thank you, Lord, that it still pleases you through the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And I pray, Lord, that you would once again manifest your word through preaching. And 
I pray, God, that you would help this preacher as he brings the message this morning, and please help each listener as they listen to the message today, that your will would be accomplished in each of our lives this morning. This is the, the message for this morning hour. Lord, it's the only opportunity we'll have to hear from you this morning. And so I pray that you'd open our understanding and give us ears to hear what you would say to your church today. Help each of us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Roger Staubach. If I say Roger Staubach, how many of you know that name? Quite a few of you, all right? He was a Hall of Fame quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys. And uh, from about, I think, about 1969 to 1979, came out of the Naval Academy. <clears throat> and um, he was quarterback for the Cowboys, won two Super Bowls, 1971 and 1979. But he never called his own plays. The coach of the Dallas Cowboys was a man named Tom Landry. And Tom Landry believed in calling his own plays. Only in an emergency situation could Staubach change the play, but he'd better be right. Or he would be in some hot water. He did know that Coach Landry had a genius mind when it came to football and strategy. But you know, athletes are prone to be pretty proud guys. I uh, have pretty big egos, and it wasn't easy for him uh, not to call his own plays, not to run the team, so to speak, but always wait for the word from the sidelines in order to call the play. And so Staubach said this, I faced up to the issue of submission. Once I learned to submit, there was harmony, fulfillment, and victory. And, and he has two Super Bowls and a Hall of Fame career. You understand, <clears throat> submission. Submission is not usually anybody's favorite word. Okay, That's a word most of us shy away from. In fact, <clears throat> the word submit or obey has been taken out of the modern marriage vows. They don't even want that word there. Uh, and it's out of most people's vocabulary. You know... If you've ever been out on a country road somewhere and you drive and you come to a, a one-lane bridge, sometimes it's got a cover on it, and other times it doesn't, it's just a... But in other words, one car is going to go across there and, and there's a sign before that bridge and it says, yield. So, and, and you can, you, you stop and if no one's coming the other way, you can go across the bridge. But you know what's interesting? When you go across that bridge, you do what you do, you come back the same way, and now you're coming the other direction, there's a sign on that side of the bridge. And you know what that sign says? Yield. In other words, both of you are yielding, and if you don't yield and you both try to go at the same time, there's going to be a collision. Okay? And there's gonna and, and you know what happens when you get in a car collision? It hurts. Okay? Uh, it's not fun. And God is telling us here that uh, we are to be submissive or submitted to Him. How many have learned that when you're not submitted to God, there's a collision? And how many of you know that doesn't feel so good? And God always wins in those collisions, by the way. <clears throat> so we're to submit to God. And that's uh, submitting my will to His will, submitting my understanding to His understanding, submitting myself completely to Him. Each of us, listen carefully, everyone in the room at one time or another has tried to make changes in your life. You looked at your life and said, I don't like this. I'm going to do better. I'm going to, and you, you spend it set out and decide what changes you want to make. And you decide to uh, do better, whether it's in, in your social life or in your uh, uh, physical life or whether it's your personal relationship with God to love others more than yourself or to serve God more acceptably, uh, not to get stained by the things of the world, what, whatever it may be, you decide, I'm going to be different. I'm going to make some changes. And then you begin and, and <clears throat> maybe it goes well for a few days and then 
uh, you slip up or you mess up or you don't get up or whatever the thing may be and then you get discouraged and pretty soon about six weeks or two months or three months later someone asks you how you're doing and you have to admit I think I'm right back where I started. You probably, it's, it's only May, the first Sunday of May, but if I said, let's, let's get out your list of New Year's resolutions uh, that you made, how things are going to be different this year, you're only four months plus a week into it, how's that working for you? And a lot of times we get discouraged and we just quit, or we get the pep talk from somebody and it's, man, try harder, come on, get back out there and do it, you can get it done. And we, we get excited and we kind of get the adrenaline pumping again. And so we say, well, I'll give it another run. And we try again. But we fail again. And a lot of times we look at our lives and we say, well, I don't see any changing going on. I guess just, just, this is just the way I'm going to be. Well, what is, what is the path to promotion? What is the path to change? What is the path to get better in our life? Well, God gives us something here in James chapter 4. I think it's His path to promotion. And it deals with that first word we talked about, submission. Notice the first verse, verse number 6, is submitting to God. Notice what he says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Submit. It's a verb that means to yield to the power or the authority of another. A.W. Tozer, a famous preacher from the past, said this, The reason why so many are troubled, still seeking, still making little forward progress, is because they have not yet come to the end of themselves. We are still trying to give orders, interfering with God's work within us. Do you hear that? The reason we don't make progress is because we still give the orders. We still want to be in charge. One of the biggest things that you deal with, why why it's so easy to preach to the men in prison. Because it's so easy to talk to those guys and say, all right, you've been in charge of your life. You've done it your way. How's that working for you? And they look down at the prison blues and say, well, yeah, that's where it ended up doing it my way. There's got to be another way. There's got to be a better way. And, of course, we can tell them that better way. Amen? But it's not so easy when you're not in that situation. Over in Rockford, they talk about the folks who come into the discipleship homes there. And and they talk about there comes a a time in that six-month period where, where they either submit their will to God, submit their way for God's way, submit their understanding for God's understanding, submit what they want for what God wants, If they don't submit, they run. You know why they run? Because they still want to call the shots. I still want to say what I can do. And they won't submit to God. And that's why they don't have victory. Submission to God. Now, let me tell you something. Submission is different than obedience. Did you know you can obey without submitting? You've all heard the story of the mother who <clears throat> uh, had a son and he was in trouble and so he was told to sit down in the corner. And he sat down in the corner as the mother looked over at him and he looked at her and he said, I want you to know, he said, I'm sitting on the outside but I'm standing on the inside. Now, was he obeying what mom said? Yeah, he was sitting in the corner. Was he submitting to her? No, he was not. Submission is different than obedience. You can obey. You can be in church this morning because you know I should be in church, but it doesn't mean you're submitted to God this morning. It doesn't mean that you have submission in your heart. The problem is in wanting it our way. Frank Sinatra had the famous song, I did it my way. And can I tell you, my way is always the way of trouble. My way, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. Living in submission to God's will and God's way and God's word 
That's the best way. That's the way to live your life. That's the beginning step. <clears throat> if you want to climb the ladder, so to speak, in God's eyes, the very first rung on that ladder is submission to Him. The question I want to ask you this morning is, have you ever submitted your life to God? Oh, pastor, I'm saved. I didn't ask you that. Have you ever submitted your life to God? I mean, your will for His will. <clears throat> what you want for what He wants. What you think for what He says. And you, you, you yielded to a greater power and authority than you, and that's God. Have you submitted yourself to God? Doesn't the verse say, submit yourselves therefore to God? I don't think that's a suggestion. I believe it's a command. And we don't want to just obey it. We want to submit to it and have submission. Now, what follows that? <clears throat> What's the next step on the path to promotion? Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. <clears throat> now, you resist the devil, it means simply to fight. It means to act in opposition to the devil. If you never decide to submit to God, you will not resist the devil. It goes together. And the devil's the enemy, folks. If you don't think you have an enemy, listen, when you got saved, you got an enemy immediately. And that enemy is the devil. And we have an opponent who's out to destroy you. He's out to steal what he can from you. He's out to ruin your life if he can. How do I fight? How do we fight? How do we resist the devil? There's, let me give you several practical things about resisting the devil. Number one, you use the Word of God. <clears throat> when Jesus was tempted by Satan in the wilderness, every time Satan tempted him, what did Jesus answer with? The Word of God. It is written. It is written. It is written. Now, I want to ask you a question. There's the, the, what, was, what was the devil or Satan before he became the devil or Satan? What was he? He was an angel. He was a created being. Now, Jesus is the Son of God, but Jesus also is God. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. So he's God. So who created the angel that eventually became Lucifer, well, became Satan or the devil? Yeah, and that would be Jesus, wouldn't it? Do you think Jesus, if he just wanted to in his own power, could have defeated Satan? Just like that. Don't, don't ever think that there's a, you know, a big epic struggle between Jesus and Satan. It, it's not even close. It, 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 it's just, I, I, we don't have the little ones in here. I'd pick the littlest kid in here and, and you know, uh, I, I'd take somebody like, uh, how many know Drew? You know who Drew is? My grandchild, okay? Little, little Drew. And put Drew against Quentin here and say, <laughs> that's as you laugh at how lopsided that would be. It's even more so, 10,000, 1,000 times more so. Jesus got, but he didn't exercise that power. He said, it is written. Why do you think he did that? Do you think maybe he was thinking about being an example for us? That it's the power of the Word of God that we'll use? We are not, you are not stronger than Satan. And I am not stronger than Satan. The only way we're stronger than Satan is greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. Without him in us, we're no match for Satan. And so we, we won't defeat him. So we have to have the Word of God. So use the Word of God. The Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. The Word of God. Number two, by the way we live. By the way you live. Did you know the way you live can help defeat Satan and resist Satan? Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. The Bible says here in verse number 25, Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Is there a period at the end of that sentence? 
No, it's a colon. So it continues. So you don't let the sun go down on your wrath, neither give place to the devil. You know, by the, it literally means to give ground or to give territory to the devil in your life. When we allow anger, wrath, bitterness, things like that, we allow in our life, we're inviting the devil to have ground in our life. We're giving him access. And, and boy, once he moves in, it's awful hard to evict him. And so don't give place to the devil. Don't, don't allow him. It has to do with how you live. So many times Christians, we're opening up ourselves to the devil by the things we're allowing, by the way we live. Be careful about that and watch that. Then we resist the devil by the word of God, by the way we live. We resist the devil by the armor of God. Just a page over in your Bible in Ephesians 6, it talks about put on the whole armor of God in verse 11. You may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. There again, there's the enemy the devil, and it talks about the armor of God, and it talks about putting on the whole armor of God. And, and realize that this is what God's given to us to resist the devil and to resist Satan. And notice it says, we will be able to quench all, verse 16, the shield of faith, whereby ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Everything Satan has in his arsenal, God has equipped us to handle. And you cannot be defeated if you put on the armor of God. We use the word of God. We use the way we live. We use the armor of God. And then we ask Jesus for help. Because greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And so we, he, he, hey, Jesus already defeated him. And Jesus is already more powerful than him. At the, he said the seed of the woman, that's Jesus, he said, uh, Satan, you're going to bruise his heel, but he's going to crush your head. <laughs> he's going he's to crush your head, and he has. And so we can resist Satan. We can resist temptation. You can oppose the devil. Did you notice what James 4 and verse 6 said? It says, if you resist the devil, what will happen? He'll run away from you. You say, well, I just wish the devil would leave me alone. Well, why don't you resist him? Why don't you put up some opposition? And just get a little tough with him. He's a coward. He'll run away. You see it happen in Mexico all the time. You see, the, uh, we were there. We saw the storm clouds come. And, and, and Brother Jack said, oh, that's nothing. What was he doing? Resisting Satan. Listen, if you don't resist him, he keeps coming and you flee. If you resist him, he'll flee. Over and over again. But listen, you'll never get there if you don't submit to God. When you still want your way and your understanding and what you want and before what God wants, you're going to be playing right into the devil's hand. Let's go back to James 4, will you please? James chapter 4. <clears throat> the path to promotion. Number one was submit to God. Can you say that with me? To Number two, resist the devil. Resist the devil. Number three, go back to James chapter 4. Resist the devil, he'll flee from you. First words of verse 8. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Third thing we do in the path of promotion is draw nigh to God. Draw nigh to God. Did you know this morning you're as near to God as you want to be? You're as near to God as you want to be. You say, I have people all the time say, I just, I just feel like God's far away. I just feel like God, I'm not very close to God. Well, i got news for you. The problem isn't on God's end. The problem, when I feel away from God, the problem's always on my end. I'm the one who's got to make some changes. If I draw nigh to Him, He'll draw nigh to me. If you're not close to God, it's not His fault. David said in Psalm 73, in verse 28, it is good for me to draw near to God. Can I help you this morning? 
Let me help you. You want to you want to solve your tension? You want to solve your restlessness? You want to solve your anxieties? There's no psychiatrist that's going to give you that. There's no pill that's going to give you that. There's nothing you're going to drink in a bottle that's going to give it to you. I'll tell you what can give it to you. Draw nigh to God. There is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God. A place where sin cannot molest near to the heart of God. Oh, listen. Hold us. His old Jesus, blessed Redeemer, sent from the heart of God. Hold us who wait before thee near to the heart of God. David said, in thy presence are pleasures evermore. When Martha was all cumbered and all upset and all nervous about serving, Mary wasn't upset at all, was she? Mary was calm and no complaints and not nervous and not upset and not anxious. But what was Mary doing? She was sitting at Jesus' feet. See, she was trying to stay near to the heart of God. Draw nigh to God. <clears throat> Draw nigh to Him. You understand, before salvation, the Bible speaks of us as being afar off. We were, we were separated from God by our sin. You're not, you weren't close to God. Now God invites us. In fact, you know, in the Old Testament, you understand, in the Old Testament, people couldn't get close to God. It was, it was a frightening thing. When, they, they had a, they had a, when God came on Mount Sinai there uh, to Moses, they, they erected a barrier around the bottom of the mountain. And nobody could go close to that barrier. And by the way, they didn't want to. You know why? Thundering, lightning, a, a thick cloud came down. They were scared, and rightfully so. In fact, when the tabernacle was erected and later on the temple, only one person could go to the presence of God. That was a high priest, and he could do it one time a year. No one, it's just common folks like us, we couldn't have walked in there and said, I'm going into the Holy of Holies where God's presence is. No, you wouldn't. You'd be struck dead. Aren't you glad that you're now in, in God's dealing with the church? God's dealing with the New Testament believer where you know what he says? Uh, you have boldness to come to the throne of grace. You have boldness to come into the Holy of Holies. When Christ died on the cross, that veil that separated anybody from coming into the presence of God, that was torn in two from the top to the bottom. God opening the way for man. And it's really interesting. The, <clears throat> the Pharisees and the religious rulers of that day, they tried to sew that curtain back together and put it up, and they couldn't. The curtain, I'm not talking about a little curtain. It's, it's, it's like 8 to 12 inches thick. That'd be some needle, Margaret, sewing that baby up, huh? huh? They couldn't do it. And by the way, if God tore it, man ain't going to sew it back together. I'll guarantee you that. So God is saying, now we have the privilege, we have the great honor to come into the presence of God. Wow. How, how few of us take advantage of that. What an honor, what a privilege. But you understand, that there's a divine order to things in the Bible. If you don't submit to God, if you don't resist the devil, you'll never draw nigh to him. You'll always feel distant from God. You have to take it in the order that God puts it. So the first thing he said, if you're going to have a path to promotion is, you must submit to God. Number two, you must resist the devil. Number three, you must draw nigh to God. What's number four? Look at James 4 again. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, Ye double-minded, be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. I, I put all this underneath this, sorrow and sensitivity to sin. I must have a sorrow and a sensitivity to sin. That's what cleanse your hands and purify your hearts. 
Because here's the thing. Once I draw nigh to God, I won't think lightly of sin anymore. Then, then sin becomes exceeding sinful. The closer I get to the light, the more sin I see. The more easily I recognize sin. And we will become not only aware of our outward sins, cleanse your hands, but our inward sins, cleanse our hearts. Purify our heart. So we begin to, to, to see God see as God sees us. We get a sensitivity to our sin. It was, it was sin that crucified the Lord. Say, so, well, who, who was it the Romans who crucified him? Was it the religious leaders who crucified him? No, it was our sin that crucified him. Your sin and mine. I'm afraid that sometimes we're not not wrongfully so. We're, we're, we're thrilled. Aren't you don't aren't you glad? Aren't you thrilled when God forgives your sin? Have you have you had that blessing of confessing your sin and knowing that the Lord has been faithful and just, he forgives you and cleanses you from all the righteousness? And man, I rejoice that my sins are forgiven, but I'm afraid oftentimes I don't have the sorrow for sin that I ought to have when I do sin. Kind of like, yeah, okay, I did that. All right, I'll ask God to forgive me. And we have a real light view of sin. Sin, sin, we don't quite understand that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. None. And, and we, we don't see our sin as we ought to see it. We should have sorrow over sins committed and the closer you draw nigh to God, the more sorrowful and sensitive you become when you sin against Him. When you have anything in your life that you know doesn't please Him. And, and you know that that sin will, will cause you to lose that closeness to God. And you don't want that. And so you desire to keep short accounts with God. Why? Because you don't want to lose that closeness. I want to draw nigh to Him so He will draw nigh to me. And so I need to have that sorrow and that sensitivity towards sin. And then the next thing, number five, is verse number 10. Humble yourself, yourselves in the sight of the Lord. And what will He do? He shall lift you up. And by the way, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. That's a key phrase. Okay, It's not a matter of you trying to Humble yourself in the sight of men. The Pharisees were good at that. They would appear unto men to fast. They would disfigure their face. They'd put on things. They would. They want everybody to know how much they were suffering for Jesus. Okay, it's not a matter about humbling yourself before men. So, well, if I do this, everybody will think I'm humble. See, then you you're really proud. Okay, so it's humble yourself in the sight of God because He knows. Humility, someone said humility is remembering who you are in God's sight. Remembering who you are and what you are in God's sight. You know, the, the, the humbling thing is God knows all about you and He still loves you. God knows, God knows all about your sin. God knows all about my sins. And He loves me anyway. He still loves me. God knows all about me and, 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 and all about my sin. And guess what? He still wants to be near me. Sometimes we're, we, we feel like you know, you're, you're afraid to tell somebody about your past or tell somebody about things that have happened because you feel like, well, they, they won't want to be friends with me or they won't want to be close to me, won't want anything to do with me. You know what? God knows all that. And He says, I still love you and I still want to be near to you. I still want to draw nigh to you if you'll draw nigh to me. Humble yourself. When you humble yourself before God, here's His promise. He will lift you up. You don't have to promote yourself. You don't have to lift yourself up. God says, I'll do that. He'll lift you up to a new position. He may lift you up to a new relationship. He may lift you up to some new circumstances. I know He'll lift you up over the things of the world. He can, you know, the songwriter said, I want to live above the world where Satan's darts at me are hurled. Higher ground. 
And the Lord's able to lift you up to that. But if you seek to lift yourself up, if you seek to exalt yourself, God says, I'll humble you. And boy, He can humble you. And He'll put you down. But if you humble yourself, He'll lift you up. Just briefly, let me say this and we'll close. But there's rewards for the humble. Uh, Psalm 9 verse 12 says he, he remembers the cry of the humble. Psalm 10 and verse 17 says he hears the desires of the humble. We know in James chapter 4 and verse 6 it says he gives grace to the humble. Grace is, is God's sufficiency. It's God's power. It's God's ability given to us. Undeservedly so, but he'll give it to those who are humble. If you're proud, you don't get God's grace. You don't get God's sufficiency. You only get whatever you can do. If you want God's help and God's power to be manifest in your life, then it takes humility. Humbling yourself in the sight of the Lord. Submit to God. Resist the devil. Draw nigh to him. Draw nigh to God. Be sensitive and sorrowful over sin. Humble yourself. What, what will happen? He'll lift you up. He'll lift you up. That's the way to promotion. I, that's, that's quite opposite the way the world would say you get promoted. It's exactly the way God says He'll lift you up. He, you see, what Satan promises is he promises you the exaltation without the process of getting there. And, and that's what he wanted. He looked at God's throne and he said, I want to be like the Most High. I'm going to sit in that throne. I will do this. I will do that. He exalted himself. And God said, you will be brought down to the sides of the pit. God will humble that guy. He'll be, he'll be thrown forever into the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. If we should be, if we, if you'll be what you ought to be in the sight of God, He will make you what you need to be in the sight of men. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and He will lift you up. That's God's path to promotion. Let's pray together. Shall we, Father, take the truth this morning. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you here for this passage in James and the path to where you will lift us up. You will exalt us. You will use us for your glory and your honor. And Lord, it's not the way that normally people think that you get ahead or that you get promotion. But Lord, I pray this morning you've spoken to the hearts of people in this room. Lord, I pray that each of us would submit ourselves to God. Our way for your way, our understanding for your understanding, our will for your will. And there'll be a submission to you so that we can resist the devil, so that we can draw nigh to God, so that you can give us a sorrow and a sensitivity about sin in our life, so that we will humble ourselves before you, that you may lift us up, that you will exalt us. Father, I pray that you'll use the truth this morning to be a help Speak to people's hearts. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'll finish praying in just a moment. I wonder how many folks here this morning would say, Pastor, I, there's a time in my life when I knew I was a sinner who needed a Savior and that Jesus was a Savior I needed. And there's a time in my life when I know that I've called out to the Lord and asked Him to be my Savior. And Pastor, this morning I know that I'm saved. I know I'm going to heaven. Here's my hand as a testimony. Would you slip it up that I may see it? I know that I'm saved. All right, you may put it down. Are you here today and would say, Pastor, I don't know that for sure, but I'd like to know that. 
I appreciate you praying for me. I'm concerned about my soul. I'm not certain that if I died, I'd go to heaven. Pastor, pray for me this morning. Would you slip your hand up and put it back down that I may see it? All right. The message is to believers today. The path to promotion. I wonder how many believers here today would say, Preacher, the Lord has spoken to my heart. I don't know where it is on that, which rung of the ladder you might be looking at, which one God has you at. But maybe you'd look and say, I understand. The way up is the way down in God's eyes. And Pastor, this morning I'm willing to submit to God. I do want to resist Satan. I want to draw nigh to him. I want that sorrow and sensitivity to sin, and I'm willing to humble myself in the sight of the Lord and let him lift me up. Pastor, God spoke to my heart this morning. Pray for me today. Will you slip your hand up? Yes. 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 Amen. Hands all over the building. God bless you. You may put them down. In a moment, I'm going to pray. That submission will start right when the invitation starts. Come and bow your knee at an altar to the Lord. Submit yourself to Him. Tell Him you desire to oppose the devil. That you desire to draw near to Him so He can draw near to you. Desire to humble yourself under Him. Let Him do the lifting up. Not yourself. Father, thank You for speaking to people's hearts today. I pray your blessing upon each individual now. I'm praying your will will be done in every heart and life. Thank you for decisions that have already been made. I pray now, Lord, that they'll be sealed at an altar as we bow the knee humbly before you. And I pray, Lord, that we would allow you, we would follow your path to promotion. Have your way in every heart and life. I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, our pianist will play. As she plays, Brother Bob's going to sing. Lord has spoken to your heart. Respond to him this morning. Will you please? You come. Oh, to Jesus I surrender. All oh, to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all, all to Jesus I surrender, humbly at His feet I bow, Worldly pleasures all forsaken, take me, Jesus, take me now. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Oh, to Jesus I surrender, make me Savior, holy Thine. Let me feel the Holy Spirit, truly know that Thou art mine. I surrender all, I surrender To Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. All right. Go, uh, somebody get the children's church, would you, and empty the nursery out. If you have kids to get out of the nursery, go get them. If you would, bring them on up. We'll get our picture taken. Get that done quickly as we can. We'll see how we fill in with all the kids. I think we'll be all right. Sit loose in the back. We may move you up. <laughs> 